Oh, hi everybody. How long have you been staring at me, staring at my computer screen? I, I've had this like, I don't even know where this like trope or cliche uh, comes from, but I've had the fantasy for years of like opening up uh, an episode of grade school in like a swivel chair with my back and then like turning around and being like, oh, I didn't see you there and then diving into grade school. So this is kind of a less uh, cinematic, less staged version of that. Um, hi, gang. Hope you guys are doing awesome. Happy damn Friday. It's grade school. We're going to party. We're going to party talking about noise reduction. Great subject. We had a lot of good discussion about it this week. Excited to go uh, quite a bit deeper than I'm able to go in 15 minutes uh, there, uh, you know, in the normal pre-recorded. Um, yeah, good to see you guys. Glad we're all here. My buddy Gadali's here with me. What's going on, Gadali? Yo, yo. There he is. Um, let's get into it, guys. I don't think I have any announcements or anything special to talk about right off of the bat. Um, so I'm going to give everyone a second to get some questions lined up. And I'm just going to start by uh, sort of talking about a couple of ideas uh, playing off of the comments uh, that we had following uh, the release of this week's video. And then we'll talk about whatever questions you guys have got. So I'm actually in the same project that I was doing noise reduction in uh, in our pre-recorded video. And I'm going to try to get everything kind of nice and large because I know that Resolution and web compression are not necessarily our friends when it comes to uh, observing fine granular or textural detail and things. Let me save a still of this adjustment that we made the other day. And I'm going to wipe out some of the work that we were doing. So one thing that I thought we could talk about right off the bat, something that I didn't get a chance to uh, talk about in the video, is the benefit of uh, sort of teeing up a different channel or a different state or a different, uh, uh, yeah, a different channel or a different state of our image specifically for the task of noise reduction. So we can think about, you know, like uh, one example of that being to do a splitter combiner node. So I'm down here in the secondaries branch of my template node graph that I've been using for uh, a couple months now. And I'm going to hit option Y to create a splitter combiner. I could also go to color nodes. Uh, where is it? Add splitter combiner node, like so. And all that's going to do is give me three nodes that represent the red, green, and blue channels of my image. So if I go into highlight mode, you can see that's my red, that's my green, and that's my blue channel. Now, this was observed correctly in some of the comments that uh, came in in this week's pre-recorded video, but you can sometimes get sufficient results by operating asymmetrically on one or more of these channels as opposed to just hitting uh, the default uh, noise reduction node here like we were doing in the video. So in this case, I could look at potentially just noise reducing the blue channel since, uh, or, or maybe like some combination of the blue and the red. But let's just see what happens if I noise reduce the blue channel using my spatial noise reduction techniques here. Tell them we're not seeing your screen, just your face. Oh, anyway, you mean you guys don't like that kind of thing? <laughs> I like it. Yeah, it's it it. it <laughs> yeah, thanks, Gadali. <laughs> that makes me feel better. Anytime. Okay. All right. Now we're looking at now we're looking at the actual feed here. So all I've done. Let me back up a little bit. I had my second branch of my or my secondaries branch of my template node tree, and I've hit option Y to create a splitter combiner node, which gives me a red channel, a green channel, and a blue channel. And I can even look at these channels in highlight mode to see where I might be getting the most noise. Now in this image in particular, actually kind of going back and looking just at this, at these uh, individual channels, I'm not supremely confident that noise reducing just one channel is gonna do the trick, but let's give it a try. So I'm gonna do a better on my mode. I'm gonna go large on my radius and then just start looking at adding the uh, noise reduction into my um, blue channel, for example, that's the bottom one. And we could like, if I wanted to, I could just, you know, if I ended up doing the exact same thing in all three channels, I will have exactly what I would have had uh, if I had done this in this initial node number two. So it, you can even start with like, all right, here's what it would have been if I had done this exact setup here on node number two. And then you could even sort of work it in reverse and say like, okay, what can I take away without actually bringing a bunch of noise back? So red channel, I feel like I can back that 
almost all the way off, if not fully off. And let's look at the blue channel. Can I back some of that off as well? I would say so. Again, sorry about web compression. I know this is tough to spot. I'm trying to make this as easy as I can for you guys to, to see. Um, but you know, like that would be another technique that you can uh, make use of sometimes uh, is like noise reducing individual channels. So you can see here, just by noise reducing the green channel, even if I do zero out my other channels, I'm getting a lot of the benefit of what I was doing originally, but theoretically I'm only reducing, I'm only doing uh, some fraction of the noise reduction that I was introducing uh, by hitting everything uh, in the same measure. So that can be uh, a useful thing. Here's another thing that I'll show you guys before uh, we jump to questions. Sometimes you can get better results. By the way, hopefully everyone's hip to like in the pre-recorded videos as well as in grade school here. At this point, I'm assuming you've watched my DaVinci Wide Gamut workflow series. If you haven't, I'm gonna leave a link to it. Go check it out because we consistently are relying on that setup in order for things to function in the way that they should when I uh, do some of the magic that I'm doing in our sessions together. What I'm about to do right now is a great example. Um, I'm gonna right click on this node and set my gamma to linear. My noise reduction is gonna have a different character now. The main thing is that it's gonna be way more responsive, like just that little bit of it is having a massive impact. So you can you could do like a potentially like one and a half or 2% noise reduction and then maybe blend some back and here would be a great case where you actually could qualify things uh, as well if you wanted to I'm just gonna kind of keep walking this in like I'm not necessarily gonna say that that's better or worse than the noise reduction I was getting in the other state but it is different it's a fundamentally like different kind of character that I'm getting there so that's something else you can play with is noise reducing in a linear mode like this. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, I've moved on to a new frame. I was like, why did all the noise reduction go away? Let's set this into loop mode for now. So that's like another tool in uh, your quiver. And the last thing that I was going to demo would be to once again, play around with like our mode or our enabled channels here. I'm gonna set my gamma back to normal and I'm gonna set my uh, color space to LAB, and now I'm gonna set my channels. I'm gonna turn off channels two and three. So now I'm operating only on the luminance channel. Something that came up this week uh, was a, a good observation that, well, if I have my spatial noise reduction mode set to faster, I can ungang and I can just do blurring on my lumina, luma or my chroma channels, which can be really useful. Same thing if I'm in the enhanced mode, I can decouple those things and operate on them independently. If I'm in the better mode, they're stuck together, right? They're married together. I actually don't know if that's something innate of the algorithm that's being used with better or if it's a bug on uh, Blackmagic's part, but right now those are ganged together. And the challenge for me is that I far prefer the character, the texture that this uh, algorithm uses. So I really don't wanna use the other ones, even though I do sometimes wanna ungang Luma from Chroma. So what I've just done by Changing my color space to uh, LAB here, or did I do it over there? Yeah, by changing this to LAB, and then by uh, setting my channels so that only channel one or my L channel is active, now I'm only noise reducing on my luminance channel. So that means I can go back to using better, and even though I'm cranking both of these things, I'm only affecting the luminance channel. So that can be uh, another potentially, uh, that, that's a good workaround for getting this better mode to uh, behave or to operate uh, just on the luminance channel, if that's indeed what we want. So just a couple of kind of additions and ideas based on uh, some of the really good comments that came in this week. Gadali, how are we looking out there? Anyone have any burning questions about noise reduction? <laughs> Uh, Jim is asking, does putting it into linear and doing smaller steps use less system resources? Boy, that's a really good question. I would, I'm like reasoning through that in my head. I think so. I don't actually know. I'm sure there's some smart person out there who could actually 
give us an easy method for evaluating uh, like drag on a system and the number of resources consumed? Heck, Gadali might know the answer to that. Do you know how that if, is there like an app or something that tells you your system work your like your drag on the CPU or the GPU? Yeah, you could use the uh, the activity monitor to see what's happening there. Oh um, yeah. I, I haven't done that for this, but it would be interesting to know. Yeah. Well, I I I, I probably shouldn't mess around with that uh, as a first trial right now, but yeah, that makes perfect sense. So there's probably a way to empirically measure that, but I would imagine so because you're hitting it with the lower strength of uh, the algorithm. So uh, I, I think uh, definitely maybe. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, EC Sanka is wondering what is the difference between Luma and Chroma noise and what are the general characteristics? Well, I mean, the the only definitive difference between those two is, you know, like everything that we do in color grading, it's all about, it's all about channels, right? So the ground truth uh, that you guys have heard me talk about before in current imaging standards, this is something that's uh, changing rapidly uh, as we speak um, and that I'm uh, involved in uh, evolving. But right now the ground truth is three channels, red, green, blue, right? Cameras capture a red, a green, and a blue component. And at the end of the day, right now, displays reproduce a red, a green, and a blue component. They have red, green, and blue photo sites uh, in the actual screen, right? So that's the ground truth. We have a red and a green and a blue channel. If we think about Luma and Chroma, those are technically what we could call predictors of like, all right, what are some reasonable ways that we could calculate a luminance channel from that red, green, and blue? That's actually what we did right here in this LAB mode. LAB is taking RGB and saying, we're gonna, we have an algorithm that is going to transform those three channels into channels that represent the luminance of the image and then two color difference channels that roughly represent uh, sort of like a blue, yellow, and then a uh, green magenta, if memory serves. But they're just difference channels that represent, uh, you know, like the color of the image in that way. So those are what we could call derived channels. That's what we were talking about last week when we talked about saturation and models like HSL and HSV. Those are derived channels that we are arriving at by some sort of formula that says, hey, if we have red, green, and blue, here's a formula that we can use to predict the hue of that red, green, and blue triplet, right? So when we say, what's the difference between Luma versus Chroma noise? All we're talking about is when I derive that channel, how much noise is in there, right? Uh, and I'm trying to think of an easy way to, yeah, let's just quickly demo this out. So let's do a, we're gonna do a couple things. This is gonna look crazier than it really is. I'm actually gonna reset this whole stack for a moment just to keep things easy. And I'm gonna do a color space transform from DaVinci Wide Gamut Intermediate into LAB. And let's just say uh, DaVinci Intermediate for that. I'm going to turn tone mapping off and I'm just going to make a round trip of this on the other side so that we can get a sensible image out of it. Bear with me. I know this looks completely crazy. I promise it's not as crazy as it looks. Okay, so right now we have a bookend. Nothing at all is happening. That's like always my my uh, gut check when we're looking at round trips into different models. But now here inside of this sandwich, I'm not in DaVinci Wide Gamut Intermediate. I'm not in RGB, I should say. I'm in LAB, meaning that I have channel one, which represents luminance, and I have A and B, which represent color difference channels. Those second two channels don't matter. All we care about is the L channel at the moment. So what I'm gonna do now is add a splitter combiner. And because I'm in LAB, this is L, this is A, and this is B. So when we say, what's the difference between chroma and luma noise? Whatever noise you see in here, this is the derived luminance channel, derived per the LAB algorithm. Whatever noise is in here is the luma noise in this particular image. Whatever noise is here or here is the chroma noise in this particular image as predicted by this model. I wanna be clear about that because there's actually no such thing as an explicit definition of chroma or of luminance, those are just derived channels and there are actually like dozens, possibly hundreds of different algorithms that have been developed over the years to say, this algorithm better predicts a uh, human 
concept of luminance, um, but they're all just predictors. They're all just ideas. The only ground truth is the red, green, and blue image that was actually captured. Everything else is just an idea. But you can see it looks like in this case, by the LAB definition, we've got a lot more noise in our A and our B channels than in our L channel, right? And as long as we're here, let's have some fun. Let's do some noise reduction on our A and our B channels and see if we don't get anything interesting out of the deal. So we've now noise reduced our A and our B channels and we've left our uh, L channel alone. And if we come back here and then let's like, you know, do what I had originally done, which is to expose up. Actually, let me just steal my exact beautiful gray that I did before. So that's my ratio. Come on, node graph. There we go. And then this is my exposure. And for some reason, something's not. Oh, am I still in highlight mode? No. Something's not happy with me. Oh, I deleted my color space transform. There we go. Let's try that one more time. So I've got my exposure. Let's just get that ratio in there as well, like so. So if we now look at the results, let's turn these two off and on now. Not that guy, just these two. We can see the denoise that we're getting out of the deal by doing it in that way. Maybe not exactly what I would wanna do there, but that's one of many methods that you can use to say like, all right, we're gonna derive those channels and then operate on those channels. And that can be noise reduction, that can be contrast that can be any operator that we want that's really the sort of binary like machine language of image manipulation is what are the channels what metric are they in meaning like log or linear or whatever and then what math are we doing to them that's really all that color grading is when uh, it comes down to the fundamentals and then it just gets really complex as you start to answer those questions so uh, long but hopefully uh, kind of interesting answer and exploration of the idea of luma versus chroma noise and luma versus chroma in general Um, question from Takedown. Uh, uh, do you have a go-to setting that you use for when you're short on time? Yes, that's that would be that would definitely be what I showed uh, in uh, this week's video as a sort of general approach. But even more generally, if I go back to my template here and just reset my noise, it's not going to be enough on this image. You know, I kind of intentionally. Uh, sourced and uh, you know used these images because they do have a high amount of noise but if you look here in my toolbox I have a preset here that's that says NR light that's noise reduction light that's the only preset I have I don't have an NR heavy because I don't like heavy noise reduction I'd rather live with a little bit of noise than uh, an over cleaned image so this is my preset that I'll drop on here and it's better small 1515 for uh, the spatial threshold and it's so weird, like, th this almost sounds dumb to say, guys, but, like, it's it always just surprises me, like, when I look at what that does on this image, I'm like, to me, it's, it's, it's like, it's not just that that's not enough. It's like, I literally don't, I barely perceive a difference there. You guys, by the time you're looking at this over YouTube, if you're seeing a difference, YouTube 5, awesome job, because I can barely see it here on my local machine. So I'm always surprised by that, but it's like, on the on images that have a sort of normal range of like a little bit of standing noise, I find that this does 80% of the job 80% of the time, and it, ha it carries almost no overhead. It carries almost no cost with it. So that's how I've kind of landed at these values is it doesn't do everything, but it does quite a bit. And whatever it does, it does very transparently. And the texture of the image never requires that I go back in and like add grain back on top like we were talking about or you know like change the blending all of which are perfectly fine solutions but uh, i think it's a great question when you're short on time i'm always short on time i never have enough time for anything so usually if i need to noise reduce this is this is like a good portion of the time all the image is going to get because i know it's going to help a little bit and it's not going to harm it and if i don't have any more time then uh, i've you know like somewhat massaged the issue um Similarly, about being short on time, a question from Nathan. If we are adding grain and the intended purpose of the footage is for web, is noise reduction worth it considering compression 
and the drag it has on the system. You know, I'll 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 answer that in this way. I'm I am like not very sophisticated when it comes to computers, and um, I don't I don't think a lot about like what they can handle, and I I. I um, I get frustrated when they slow down, but my my contention has always been, you work for me, dude. I will try to be a fair master, but you work for me. I don't care if what I'm doing is a big drag on the GPU. That's the GPU's problem. And those who know me know that I will very often just throw a fit. If I'm like, if the machine is not keeping up, I, like I'll throw a fit and say, what do we need to do to make this work? Because I am unwilling to compromise with the machine. I will not compromise with the machine. I will get what I want out of the image. There's enough other compromises in the grading process. I'm not going to compromise with technology. Technology needs to support me, not the other way around. So in terms of added drag on the system, I, I will either work through it or if I uh, am able to, I will upgrade a part or buy a new machine. I'll do whatever I need to to make. I, I won't compromise uh, on what I want to do because it doesn't. the system is having trouble with it. Um, and in terms of the direct question of like adding noise reduction underneath grain, you know, the good news is a, a, another theme that emerged in this week's comments was like, you know, how much noise, how much grain, how, how well does that stuff travel on YouTube, whether we're talking about my demos here or actual deliverable assets that we post to YouTube. And there's plenty of good conversation about how that's a tough question to answer, but it certainly doesn't travel one to one. So the insight we can glean from that is you grading in your environment, you're seeing the image as well as anyone will ever see it. People are only going to see less of it from this point forward, right? So if you have a noisy image and you add grain on top of it and you play it down and you don't perceive that underlying noise, I would say skip it, right? If you do perceive it, then you're into a judgment call of wondering like, yeah, but by the time this gets out to a YouTube compressed, you know, like rendering playing in, you know, God knows what environment on what device, will that matter? That comes down to more of a judgment call. But I would certainly say, um, you know, like less is more on that. And, and the noise has to prove itself to be problematic before I would consider, like if I'm already adding grain, I'm probably not going to go in and fuss too much over noise unless I really see it poking through the grain and compromising the grain or causing me to have to go lower on my like grain uh, sort of intensity than I otherwise would. Those would be the scenarios where I would contemplate doing some noise reduction underneath. But if you can't see it, then easy answer. If you don't see it, no one else is going to see it because it's only going to get tougher to spot from that point forward. Antonio is asking, what's your take on third party noise reduction plugins? I seem to always get better results with neat video than with DaVinci Resolve's noise reduction. Yeah, there was some good conversation about Neat Video this week. And to be honest with you guys, I haven't used it in years, and I think I probably owe it another lap. Um, this sort of goes back to uh, the question that we discussed a couple moments ago. In general, like, I, maybe this has changed, but what I remember from Neat Video is, like, I would have to drop it onto an empty node, and then I would have to hit some sort of button to get loaded into a sort of dedicated UI. Uh, Kadali, do you use Neat Video? I, I haven't used it yet. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, so uh, you guys in the chat can correct me if I'm getting this wildly wrong or if I'm uh, talking about a completely deprecated uh, form of the tool. But what I remember is having to pop into kind of a dedicated UI with a bunch of sliders and having to audition things and uh, tune them in and then hit OK to commit those changes and then, uh, you know, like work with it from there. For me, most of the time, that's an untenable, like that, that's too much time. Um, and, you know, like, as I, I told you guys at the beginning of uh, the pre-recorded video this week, I care about noise and I care about managing it. And that's part of my job for sure. But it is an area of lower priority for me. Like if I can if I can save 30 seconds or 60 seconds on noise reduction and get most of the benefits, I'm probably going to take that deal because I'd rather spend the time on nuancing uh, the color, the contrast of the image. So I owe Neat Video uh, a fresh look because it's been many years, but that's... Um, that's my general take on third-party noise reduction plugins. And to be honest, that's the only one that I'm aware of. I, I, I'm not aware of any other third-party noise reduction plugins. And certainly Neat Video is the one that seems to get uh, the most universal accolade. So I feel reasonably confident that's probably the best one. It's just a question of 
what's the cost benefit there? How much more time does it take me? And uh, how greatly does it benefit uh, the end product? Which, as I said, I'm open to, I, I, I'm not giving a definitive answer to that question. I may need to reevaluate the cost benefit. But for the moment, in my practice, the amount of noise reduction I do, the priority that I place on it, the amount of time I'm willing to spend on it, the built-in uh, noise reducer and resolve does okay for me. Praveen is wondering, when working on a VFX heavy project, should one do noise reduction on clips before handing the clips over to VFX? Um, I mean, this is a really good question to explore. Um, I'm going to play the naive part here because I, I have a, a sense of why this question is being asked. But my question really would be, why would we even consider that? We wouldn't consider grading an image before sending it to VFX. Like, why would we do that? And if I can sort of fill in for Praveen, I imagine the answer is to give the compositor somewhat of an easier task of pulling keys or, um, you know, like doing their job, get, making it easier for them to do their job. I, I would say, like, having been a compositor a little bit um, and knowing enough compositors, I think the answer on the compositor side would probably be, don't help me. I got this, you know, like... This is actually, uh, I, I want to circle back to this topic in a moment because we've talked about placement of noise reduction in the node tree quite a bit this week, and that this is a really important topic. But one of the justifications that I hear for placing noise reduction at the head of a node tree is because it makes it easier to pull keys. A compositor would rebut that by saying, well, if I need to pull a cleaner key by blurring or noise reducing the image, I will noise reduce my input into that keyer but I will not noise reduce the actual image as it's gonna be shipped on down. Like in other words, you can noise reduce the input into a keyer without noise reducing the image that's actually gonna be rendered out uh, from you know, like whatever point in the timeline you are. So kind of the same thing there, like a compositor, if they need to noise reduce in order to pull a cleaner key, they will noise reduce. And furthermore, they will do it not on the actual final image, but just on a separate branch of the node graph that allows them to pull that key without altering the vinyl image if that's not the intent, if that makes sense. So all a very long answer to say, no, I would give uh, the VFX artist the completely uh, you know, native image and let them deal with it. And I've, I've never had a VFX artist tell me, you should have done more before you shipped VFX assets to me. Um, they're very happy as we are as colorists to take the raw, you know, like unmanipulated image and work with it from there. AC Sanka is asking, how would you use temporal noise reduction and what is motion range? Yeah, so let's talk about temporal noise reduction for a moment. So these shots, I think these are all kind of high speed if I remember correctly. Yeah, so maybe, maybe not the most dramatic examples, but let's talk about Let's just try doing temporal noise reduction on this instead of um, spatial. So I'm going to expose this up a little bit. I'm just going to really make, I'm going to give myself some problems. And then let's go over here to our ratio and just kind of set some contrast pivot like so. Okay. And now down here in my secondaries branch, instead of spatial, we're going to play around with temporal noise reduction. So let's just walk through what these settings do. The first setting, I touched on this briefly in this week's video, frames, this is how many frames backward and forward do you want Resolve to sample and look for a pattern. So if I set this to one, what Resolve is gonna do is look one frame backward and one frame forward for every single frame and look at what's consistent, what remains, what goes unchanged between the, those two frames and then it's going to subtract that, essentially, and, and compute that as noise. And as you bump this up, it's just going to keep analyzing more and more frames forward and backwards up to five. I would do this if I were doing temporal noise reduction. I would definitely not do more than two. My preference would be to do one because you can get odd sort of like cadence of motion. And another thing that I didn't even talk about in this week's pre-recorded video, which is that you can get nasty little artifacts, like motion artifacts by uh, the, the higher you set this number, the more you can get a, a motion artifact where it's improperly 
deducing what is image and what is noise, essentially. Um, and the, they can be very tough to spot. Um, so it's something that I don't like to open the uncertainty of. It's kind of along the similar lines of like, why I'm so reticent to pull keys. Aside from my whole philosophy of why I don't think that's necessarily the best approach, qualifiers are like problem kids, uh, to use the analogy that you guys uh, have heard me use before, that like, I gotta babysit them really, really hard and make sure that I'm not shipping out uh, an image that has an obvious or a chattery key in it. Same thing with this. Once I open up Pandora's box here, I have to babysit this clip for the rest of its lifespan to make sure there's not a single like one or two or three frame artifact being introduced that a QC house is going to call out that I then have to go back in and repair. I really would prefer not to do that. Um, so that's why I avoid it in general. But if I'm using it, I'm going to try to keep this number as low as possible. Motion estimation type faster and better. You know, this kind of goes back to the conversation about like being hard on the machine. The machine works for me. Of course, I want it better. I'm not going to compromise with the machine, make it better. Motion range, this is an attempt at uh, trying to best solve the problem as we discussed it a few minutes ago, basically trying to avoid, or a few moments ago, I should say, we're basically just trying to avoid artifacts. We're trying to do a better job based on the information we give about how much motion is resident inside of the frame, whether that's camera or subject motion. We're trying to get a sense for like, when we answer this, as uh, like when we give resolve this information, it applies that to the way it is deducing what is noise and what is image, if that makes sense. So theoretically, the more aligned we are, the, the more accurately we describe the image in terms of large, medium or small range of motion, the better a job the resolve algorithm is going to do of separating out image from noise, theoretically. Um, and then down here, our thresholds are going to be similar. And motion to be honest with you i don't quite remember what's up with the motion slider someone can chime in on the chat and, and school me on that if you want it's been a while since they used the temporal threshold um uh you know form of or the temporal noise reduction uh palette here in resolve Godali, do you know off the top of your head what that one's for i don't but i'm opening the manual now to to learn yeah and you know what that's something we don't talk much uh, enough about here on grade school I love answering y'all's questions and I hope we get to keep doing grade school for forever. But if you have questions about stuff when you're like in Resolve and working on like a Tuesday or whatever, the Resolve manual is awesome. Like it's so well written and so comprehensive and everything is in chapters. So like by the time I get done talking right now, Gadali will probably have found the entry on noise reduction inside of Resolve. Even though that manual is like 4,000 some odd pages, it's very easy to navigate and it's very comprehensive. And when Gadali does find that entry, he will find an explicit entry for this parameter of the temporal noise reduction uh, feature. And it will explicitly describe what the motion slider does. How's that for some pressure, Gadali? Did you find it? I'm still looking. All right, You'll, we'll, we'll circle back on that. Yeah, um, but I mean, like, very just looking at it, uh, just visually, the more I bump that up, the better it seems to behave. So that's actually not bad. So like, this is a pretty good template for how I would use temporal noise reduction, with the caveat that we are going to uh, re-educate Cullen on what the motion slider uh, exactly means, uh, so that I can make sure I'm not doing something that I don't actually want to be doing. Um, so yeah, temporal noise reduction. Uh, what else we got out there, Godali? With your with your other brain, you can pitch me the next question. Yeah, well, I can multi-brain. Um, <laughs> Jim actually had a question earlier about uh, viewing feature. Uh, he said, "I tend to use the highlight difference while having noise reduction in the highlight mode to see what the noise reduction is affecting. Is there any reason why that is not a good option?" No, that's a great idea. And I can't remember if it was Jim or someone else who mentioned that in this week's comments, but that's a great idea to get some context for the actual noise that you are uh, extracting from the image. So I've just gone into highlight mode by hitting my magic wand. And then what I imagine Jim does is to use a difference mode here to sort of look at, okay, what was the image and what is the difference of the noise reduction that I'm applying here so that you can actually get a visual sense for like, all right, that's a decent amount of noise that's coming out and some amount of image as well, but it's not a problematic amount, I don't think. And if we set this back to zero, 
that effectively nulls everything out here on the temporal side. And we could do the same exercise with our spatial noise reduction and just look at what's being uh, affected here inside of uh, the image. It's also interesting, like if we look at the maybe some of the potential limitation, it's like I'm seeing all of this noise in the sky that's theoretically being cleaned up. But by the time this image travels through my, my color management stack and everything else that's going on, I'm not perceiving a huge change there. Like I'm seeing some, but not a huge change. It's really just down here in the mid lower exposures where the subjects are living that we were perceiving things, which was why we were uh, exploring using the qualifier to sort of flag things off. You know, like that's a theme that emerged in uh, this week's video and also in our conversation today. I'm always looking for a way to get like the most that I can out of the, the noise reducer, but also to confine its operation so that it's not affecting areas it doesn't need to. Like if you, you know, sort of do an imaginative exercise, if the subjects were perfectly clean in this image, I probably wouldn't even care about this guy or I would care very little about it. So that's like a great example of why I might want to flag off the sky and just exclude it from the deal so that we're only operating on uh, the, the areas that are currently black as opposed to the white uh, areas that I'm flagging off and just kind of limiting that down because I don't really care about cleaning all the noise and, and uh, having to deal with the sort of odd texture that can arise from noise reduction in the sky. Like maybe a little bit of that if I want to, you know, like soften this way out and, you know, kind of like bring it back over here to the right. Like you can, I can have, I can have sort of a gradual effect up there, but I probably don't need to affect the sky as much as uh, my subjects down here because they are, uh, that's where my eye is looking hopefully. And that's really where the, the critical place for noise reduction. Uh, but yeah, great idea. The, the highlight mode thing. I'm glad we got to touch on that. All right, I did find it in the manual, page 3,265. Uh, so it's a motion threshold slider to um, essentially help prevent motion artifacts by not uh, applying the frame averaging to parts of the image that are in motion. So you can set what that threshold is depending on how much motion you're seeing. Okay, cool. And then while we're, we're right there in that section, uh, just recap the motion range uh, parameter as well. Yeah, um, so it lets you set the speed of motion that the motion estimation should expect to exclude. Um, so small assumes slow moving subjects and uh, you know, large setting assumes that there's fast motion with blur. Cool, cool. Yeah, so we can see like that, you know, we could expect a pretty high amount of interaction between this and this in terms of trying to prevent artifacts. So that's something you could do. Like, I wish we had a better example image here where I was introducing a, an obvious artifact. But if you really like temporal noise reduction, and I heard from several uh, folks this week who are like, you know, you're you're dismissing temporal noise reduction too readily. Like there's, it can actually get you really clean results. And I'll concede that. I think there may be some merit to that. And if you have the time and you really prefer what you get out of temporal noise reduction, what you could do is kind of keep an eagle eye out for motion artifacts. And if you get them, probably the two levers to pull on most readily, other than just backing everything off, would be motion range and this motion slider here, as we've just confirmed by uh, checking the resolve manual. So you could likely... Keep an eye out for artifacts, and if you see them, neutralize them by finding a sweet spot for uh, an interaction between those two parameters. And maybe I learned something today. Maybe I'll try that the next time I'm noise reducing and at least audition temporal noise reduction as an alternative to uh, spatial noise reduction, because it's, of course, important, and we should be looking to get the best results we can uh, within the confines of prioritizing the gazillion other things that we have to do when we're color grading. Um, yeah, thanks for the manual assist, Kadali. You're welcome. What else we got? All right. Praveen is wondering, is it okay to ungang Luma and Chroma and try working on Chroma noise before going to Luma if needed? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, you could probably make a much more thorough study than I ever have of like, under what conditions is more noise present in Luma versus Chroma channels? 
what kind of camera, what kind of scene conditions, what kind of ISOs, what kind of color management or, uh, you know, like uh, working color space. There's so many variables in there and you could, if you really wanted to, probably make a reasonable study of like, well, under the following conditions, you can reasonably expect that chroma will be a better lever to pull than luma. And under these alternate conditions, luma may be a better lever to pull than chroma. But short of doing that kind of like empirical study, that seems perfectly sensible to me to start with one, see what it does for you, and then dial in the other as needed. And then maybe even just as a simple alternative to that exercise, try it the opposite way. Try working just your luma and then try adding in chroma as needed. And then you've got the best result from that version and maybe the best result from the other. And then stage a shootout, A, B between them and see which one has netted you better results. And that's probably the one uh, to go with. I love doing things like that, sometimes to uh, my own detriment because I'll forget that I'm actually supposed to be color grading for clients. This is when I'm not in the room. This is when I'm uh, you know, tasking solo on stuff. I love staging shootouts and finding uh, the best version of the you know, the best solution to the problem. So I encourage you to do the same uh, as long as you don't blow your deadlines, which I do sometimes. Um, let's see. Uh, EC Sanka asks, is the blue channel the most noisy as the days of CRTs and calibration Sony monitors with blue only? I you know, I would say no to that. I would say if the, I, I think it's it's tough to make this broad of a statement, but typically the green channel is going to be the most noisy. And that's due to the simple fact that if we look at the way the image was actually captured, there is a ratio of for for every red photosite on a camera sensor, there are two green photosites. Same thing for blue. There are twice as many green photosites as red or blue photosites. Green represents a larger chunk of the original image than um, red or blue do. So typically we're gonna see the most noise in the green channel just because more photosites were capturing the green channel than the red or the blue. Uh, so that would be the general rule of thumb. And of course, like the whole point of uh, what we were talking about of operating on individual red, green, or blue channels is that that's not a fixed thing. If it was, our noise reducer would just be weighted to operate on the green channel only. Um, but it just varies depending on the conditions of the uh, image and on what we're doing in our grade. But in general, you're going to find that the green channel has uh, the most uh, noise in there. And in fact, if you look at like the Rec. 709 to use a fancy word, the coefficients for deriving luminance from RGB, uh, the Rec. 709 coefficients for deriving that or the formula for that is as follows. You take about 70% of your green channel and you take about 20% of your red channel and you take about uh, 9%. I, it always bothers me when I quote these figures and they don't add up to 100, but roughly 70% of your green, roughly 20% of your red, roughly eight or 9% of your blue that's the formula for deriving luminance. So your luminance is composed of 70 something percent of the green channel. So the green channel is very important. It drives a lot of what we do in color grading and that happens uh, at various points, including at acquisition. So you're generally gonna see the most noise uh, in that green channel. Um, Prashant is wondering, should we split the image into RGB channels and target a specific channel for noise reduction? You certainly can. I think it's all a cost benefit analysis. Like you might find, you know, like there are parts of color grading that I've done this kind of exploration on that, to be honest, I haven't done with noise reduction. But the next time you have a morning free, you could sit down and be like, OK, I've got a good data set here of let's say 50 noisy images from different cameras under different lighting conditions. And I'm going to look and see if I can't find sort of the best general fit for noise reducing these images. And what you might find at the end of that sort of like subjective testing is, hey, the best thing is actually spatial noise reduction with the following parameters. That actually seems to work for the majority of cases the best. You might find that it's temporal noise reduction, or you might find that doing a splitter combiner and working your green channel first and then only noise reducing the red and the blue when necessary, that gives you the best results. Like you could reach any number of conclusions. And once you've done that, 
then you could save like this splitter combiner stack into like a toolbox power grade like I have over here. And now every time you noise reduce, you can know, all right, I'm just gonna start there. I'm not gonna try one thing and then ultimately realize I need to do this. I'm just gonna start there. Um, so that would be like one sort of workflow that you could implement or develop for getting the optimal noise reduction. I think short of that, planning to just kind of like audition this every time you noise reduce as like one of a menu of options. For me, that would be prohibitive in terms of time, just because it takes a certain amount of time to add a splitter combiner, to tap onto node number 10 and to play around with noise reduction there. So I would look to find a consistent, uh, you know, sort of baseline for that, that I could reuse via a power grade if I felt like that was beneficial or something I wanted to do quite a bit. But that's, you know, more procedural type of workflow guidance in general. Yeah, for sure. Like the, there's, I don't see any downside other than time to adding a splitter combiner and noise reducing uh, per channel and just seeing what's needed per channel, uh, you know, and using that approach. Um, Christian wonders when grading film scans or an airy baked in texture from the camera, how do we best take out noise without removing the grain or texture? Well, I think that th that this is where, you know, like so much of this stuff is subjective. Like there, there's not going to be a hardcore, like color science answer to that question, uh, is w even though that would be kind of my first impulse. So it really just comes down to, you know, at that point, what it sounds to me like you're looking at is some kind of qualification, right? Like you're having to look at the image and deduce, okay, what is the character? Where is the noise? What I perceive as noise, what I perceive as what needs to go away. Where is that noise resident in the image? Is it in shadows? Is it in highlights? Is it in high saturation areas, low saturation areas? Uh, what, what are the sort of characteristics of the areas where I would like to scrub out that noise versus where uh, is the sort of resident pleasing texture that I don't necessarily want to obliterate. Um, so you could, you know, like make that assessment. And then from there, you're probably looking at a qualifier um, and qualifying based on those parameters. You're going to have to do that by hand. You're not going to be able to just go in and eyedropper things. You're going to have to assess and say like, hey, the noise I really want to see scrubbed from this image really lives in the toe. It, it lives like not just in my subjects, but it lives in like the shadows underneath this man's beard and in the woman's hair over here. And so I'm really going to target those areas and go way, way soft above that. And that's where I'm going to really aim my noise reduction and hit hard so that, you know, like this is not necessarily how I feel. But let's say that even though there's noise in plenty of other areas outside of this qualifier, let's say for the sake of argument, I think that noise is pleasing. I think it's filmic or grain like and I want to keep it. This is how I would go about that is by empirically analyzing and deciding where is what I want to keep and where is what I want to scrub out and proceeding uh, along those lines. Another thing that I'll mention just because this made me think of it is you can sometimes get some interesting noise reduction by using this texture pop tool and taking it into advanced mode. In a no an image with this much noise, we may not have a ton of luck, but here's the way I would go about that, just trying it. I'm gonna turn my strength all the way up so it's easy to spot the differences. And then I'm gonna use my panel just because I like the sensitivity of the knobs. And you can look at these different sort of frequencies or wavelengths of texture and maybe start with like your medium. And I'm going the wrong direction. I actually wanna take that down like so. Medium's not really hitting it. The, the texture of the grain is kind of finer than that. So I'm going to go all the way to the top and look at my uh, tiny details like so. I can see that might actually be too fine because I'm leaving behind blurry noise. So let's just try to find fine. So it looks to me like a combination of fine and tiny may be able to give me some interesting results, especially if I go down now into my lower octaves, uh, like to the medium back onto that side and I work things in a positive direction. Maybe the small is a better candidate. Like you can sort of do some texture remapping here. Now in this case, I'll be totally honest, I don't love what I'm accomplishing here, but I've done stuff along these lines where I'm basically equalizing the, to use a fancy term, the modulation transfer function 
the sharpness in uh, various like frequencies or textural uh, areas of the image. And you can noise reduce using methods like this. And it might just be that now, you know, I set that strength way up high earlier. Maybe I would just back that off. And that's, like I said, maybe not how I would go about it in this particular image, but that's an interesting approach. And you can even look at how much impact you are having in shadows, midtones, and highlights, and sort of flag things off uh, in that regard as well. So this texture pop tool can actually be a really fun alternative way of uh, attacking noise reduction. Um, so just a, another addition there. But yeah, that, that general question of like, how do I remove noise without removing grain or how do I remo remove noise without removing texture? I think that's the art and the craft of uh, this, this whole subject that we've been exploring. So um, yeah, happy, happy noise hunting, noise reducing. Um, Brace Films is asking, does noise reduction help when a shot has an oversaturated color in it? For example, neon lights or clipping reds. Desaturating those strong colors always ends up in artifacts for me. Hmm. Well, that's a big subject that I uh, wouldn't necessarily uh, sort of lens through the, the tool set of noise reduction necessarily. There's lots of ways that that can come about um, that you can end up with like the sort of gamut clipping that you're talking about where it's like, oh, like it's is not just a matter of turning saturation down. It's like clipped in there. Um, I've, we've talked about this in other grade schools before. It's especially easy to encounter if you're working in ACES prior to ACES 1.3. Um, so without going off on a whole tangent about uh, gamut uh, clipping issues, which uh, are, are uh, I love to talk about, I would say noise reduction would not be the first way that I would lens that. I would look at the overall color management pipeline and making sure, you know, if you're encountering that issue, the first thing you want to make sure of is that nothing you are doing is actually causing the issue that you're finding that you, you now can't fix. Um, it sounds obvious to say, but you'd be amazed how often that's the case. You're like, oh, well, I can't fix it by hitting the saturation knob. It's like, well, you can't fix it with that tool at that point in your pipeline, but the actual problem is being introduced by you elsewhere in your pipeline. That's often the case. I would say 80% of the time, that's the case when you're getting an apparent hard gamut clip. Uh, and that's a big topic that we can explore in another grade school. Um, but if it's not that, if uh, you are indeed looking at a hard gamut clip that is just in camera, nothing you can do about it, noise reduction still isn't what I would think of first. I would tend to think more about, uh, you can think about textural stuff for sure, like the texture pop tool that we were just looking at would be a useful candidate potentially, uh, or doing some kind of highlight bloom or softening. Uh, if that's a high luminance, high saturation area, those things can all be your friend. Um, but you're, you're on the right path in that if it's truly clipped and there's nothing you can do about it, starting to manipulate texture in a targeted way can be a way of softening that out. So that's, uh, that is something worth exploring, but you always want to start by making sure you're not, not actually causing the, uh, the disease for which you now are looking for a cure, if that makes sense. All right. Um, different question from Uliana. When using a splitter combiner node, each channel appears black and white. Why isn't blue, blue, red, red, etc.? And how could there be other colors in a channel, like in the RGB mixer? That's an interesting question. Yeah. So the, I mean, the reason why we are looking at red, green, and blue is because these are, th this is just, if we think about like an, a really simple imaging system, if I look at like my display right now, a reference display, let's say that it has, it only has three pixels. It has, it, it only has three like individual LED diodes on it. Okay. Just little, tiny diodes on the surface of the screen. There's one for red, one for green, and one for blue. When does that, when, when does the image that I send to that screen become colorful? It's at the point of the display. So what I'm gonna send to that individual LED diode, like if we go super simple with this for a moment, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna send 
a monochrome image of a certain strength. If it's zero, that means don't turn on the diode at all. If it's one, it means turn on the diode at full strength. If it's 0.5, it means turn it on at 50% strength. And then the same thing is gonna be true for green, and the same thing is gonna be true for blue. And uh, I'll, I'll refine or, or clarify the experiment a little bit. Let's say that those, this is an impossible scenario, but let's say that those diodes are actually stacked. So we have a red, a green, and a blue, just one pixel of red, green, and blue. Where I start to get color and hue and saturation is in the combination of those red, green, and blue diodes, if that makes sense. So if I send it just a monochrome channel of red, if I send a triplet of one red, zero green, zero blue, the LED diode will light up full red, the green will not light up at all, and the blue will not light up at all, and all I will see as the viewer is a red pixel, right? If I add full green into there, so I send it one red, one green, zero blue, that LED diode will not appear to me as the viewer as one red plus one green plus zero blue, it will appear to me as yellow, right? Same thing as if I add red, green, and blue, that will appear to me as white because I've maxed out all three diodes and they're all equal to one another. So there is gonna be no color perceived between them because they're all pushing out equal strength of red, green, and blue. Um, so this is like a very simplistic way of saying that color essentially happens at the display. And until that point, everything that we are doing is just how much red, how much green, and how much blue, and what are we doing to those channels in between the way they were captured and the way they were reproduced. So it's a really good question with kind of a slippery conceptual answer, but that's the best I can think of it on the fly, is that they are individual channels which in and of themselves don't know anything about color. It's just intensity of red, green, and blue. And for example, if I, I could swap my channels here, like even though these are monochrome, look what happens if I swap my red and my blue. So I take the red and I route it to the blue, like so, and I take the blue and I route it to the red. If I turn this back on, now my channels are all mixed up, right? Because the color is being reproduced by how we assign these monochrome channels to color reproducing uh, photocytes, if that makes sense. So they're individual monochrome channels that are being combined together to produce color, if that makes sense. Right. Uh, let's see. Um, Jim is wondering about a, uh, your explanation for when is the best time to do noise reduction at the start or after all the grading. He tends to put it in the first node but doesn't turn it on till he grades. And I would also add just the, the order of operations in your node tree versus when you right. actually do it like before or after your yeah. grade. Your order of, of actual grading operations. Yeah. yeah, totally. I'm glad we brought that up. That's a great place for us to close out for today. So I, I want to talk about that um, by, first of all, observing like, I can't remember if Jim, uh, you made this point or if, uh, if, if, if it was someone else this week, but we were talking about one of the, you know, reasonable explanations for why you might stick noise reduction at the head and have it placed there. And then when you, if and when you want to noise reduce, turning it on. So in that case, we're talking about a workflow where in the node tree, it comes very first, but in your process, it comes later, really only when you perceive an issue, and it's an option that you elect when uh, the need arises, right? That's kind of the idea there. Um, and I think in general, that's the right idea. My only tweak is that I still would not put this at the head of the node tree. The explanations that I've heard for that uh, in the past include that like, well, it allows me to cache things off. Uh, it allows me to cache that noise reduction off so that uh, it's already cached and ready to go and I get better performance. As we talked about before, sometimes to my fault, I don't care about taking it easy on the machine. The machine's gonna meet my expectations or I'm gonna get a new machine. Um, the other reason that we touched on earlier is like, well, I'm gonna have an easier time pulling qualifiers on a clean image than on a noisy image. So if it's noisy, I wanna get it denoised before I start pulling keys, right? Also reasonable, but that's kind of where I want to round us out for today. Let's just do, I'm going to, you guys are going to look at my face for a second and I'm going to flip over to my 
good old fashioned grade school project to close us out here. And we're gonna talk about having our cake and eating it too, because that's totally true that sometimes you can and sometimes you want to pull keys off of a denoised image and you'll get better results there, um, even though you might not want that noise reduction in your image. There is a way to do that inside of Resolve. So I'm just gonna mock this up. I probably didn't even need to switch projects because I don't have a noisy image in here necessarily, but let's just, I wanted to have something with more color. So let's go back to this image that we were working on last week and say, just for the sake of argument, you know, this is a very clean image, but let's, let's say I need to pull a really pristine key on the foliage here. And I feel that it's noisy enough that I would like to denoise before I pull that key, right? Well, it turns out you don't need to denoise the actual final image just to pull that key. So if we do something like this, Let's do my template node tree. Like Pull in so. your resolve screen went away. Oh, that's right. Let me flip back over here. Thank you. Uh, so I've got my template node tree pulled up here. And what I'm going to do is down here in my secondaries pipe, I want to pull a key for, uh, for uh, I want to pull a key on the denoised image. So let's think about how we could actually do that. One way would be to do a layer mixer. And what I'm going to do is actually delete this mixer node completely here. Okay. And I'm going to reconnect these. And what I'm going to do at this point is actually, am I getting that right? I'm having to reason through this. This is kind of more of a compositing style operation. Um, yeah, no, I'm getting this right. So if I want to pull this key and then operate on this key, I've got a separate branch that I'm going to pull in here. And I'm going to now on this channel down here, again, we're just kind of having to mock this up because this is in fact not a noisy image, but let's say it is. I'm going to go hard on the noise reduction so that it would be obvious if we were seeing this, if I paste it up here and I zoom in and I turn my gallery off, that noise reduction, hopefully even on YouTube, you guys can all see that. That's like very, very obvious noise reduction, right? And let's say I don't really want that, but that's actually optimal for getting helping me pull a cleaner key. Well, I've now pulled, I've, I've made that noise reduction, and now the state of image that I'm using to pull my qualifier is noise reduced, like so. And let's just say I want to pull, you know, whatever, like these, this foliage here. Um, and I'm now going to feed that into my keyer up here. Whoops. That's not what I wanted. Let's narrow this width way down here on this qualifier. So whatever, like there, let's say that's my beautiful green key that I wanted to pull. I now have a key that I pulled based on a noise reduced image, but whatever I do, and let's just say that, you know, whatever I'm, I'm doing, I'm committing crimes against color grading right now with the terrible work that I'm doing, but I am gonna add some saturation into these greens. Let's say that was my whole goal here was to pull a key, a really clean key on the foliage and to pump a bunch of saturation into there. I pulled that really clean key, but that clean, that noise reduction that I used to help get that clean key isn't resident anywhere except in the channel that I used to pull the key. Does that make sense? It's a little bit slippery, but I'm pulling a dedicated branch, noise reducing, and then the only place that branch ever goes is as a key channel that feeds back up into my main secondaries pipeline. Okay. So up here, this, the RGB result of this never goes anywhere except to feed into this qualifier. And then from that point forward, all I'm passing forward is an alpha channel or a mat or a key, but the actual noise reduced RGB never makes it into the full image. I mean, it never makes it into the image at all. It's just used to pull that key. That's a very compositor style adjustment. That's what I was alluding to earlier. When I talked about that, compositors will operate on an image in anticipation of keying or tracking it all the time and operate it on, a, on it in a way that would be completely unacceptable or uh, not desirable for the image itself, for the visible image, but which helps in pulling a key or uh, drawing a tracker, whatever the task may be. So we can kind of learn that lesson from compositors and do the same kind of thing. Say, hey, this branch is not for doing stuff to the image, it's for 
teeing up a better, more keyable image for the keyer. And then from that point forward, all that's actually gonna be passed along is the alpha channel. So that's a pretty advanced thing. And I think a great place to round out our conversation that went a few minutes over, my apologies for that, about noise reduction. Um, really good conversation today, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed exploring this with me. I always enjoy uh, not only sharing what works for me and what I've learned, uh, but hearing from y'all as well. I always learn something from our conversations. So uh, thanks for being active and involved and thoughtful as you guys all are. Always enjoy our conversations. And uh, yeah, this was a, a great Friday morning grade school session. Thanks for making it uh, early for me today so that I can uh, handle some other uh, stuff on my plate for the day. Uh, looking forward to next week. We're going to talk about a new subject next week and then we'll hit grade school again on Friday morning. And it's going to be awesome. Thanks to Gadali for co-hosting with me. I hope you guys have an awesome Friday and an awesome weekend. And I'll see you all very soon. Take care.